Welcome back to Canada's Great Unknown. We hope you are enjoying the stories we're putting out to the world, but this time we are heading off-world, into the stars to see what could be visiting us. Are UFOs and aliens real? Are people having these incredible experiences? Let's find out together. So sit back, relax, and enjoy these stories from areas you may recognize. If you have a story that you would like to share with us, email us at canadasgreatunknown at gmail.com. We'd also really appreciate if you followed us on Twitter at CGU Stories, on Instagram and TikTok at Canada's Great Unknown. Also, we'd appreciate it if you clicked on that subscribe button and rang that bell to support us right here on YouTube so you can follow along when we post new content. Please leave a comment below and let us know what you think or stories you would like to hear. Hi there, Canada's Great Unknown. My name is Andy, and back in the early 1980s, I joined the Canadian Armed Forces Naval Fleet because I felt there was no life like it. There was no life like it was the Navy's advertisement that hooked me in and made me want to become a sailor. I was 19 years old at the time. During my time in the Navy, I served on three ships. I saw parts of the world I never thought I would see in my lifetime, let alone get paid to go to these different ports around the world. But there's one time that really sticks out for me. I was a radar plotter on Her Majesty's Canadian ship, Yukon. We were stationed in Esquimalt on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. It was 1983, and we were transiting to Alaska for general naval exercises that were quite frequent and routine. But this one trip, I saw something that, as a radar op, I just couldn't explain. It was the spring of 83 when we all set sail. We were in a convoy with two other sister ships. We were about 250 nautical miles west of the north tip of the Queen Charlotte Islands, which is now called Haida Gwaii. I started at my post just like any other routine day. Outside of the odd whale and small fishing vessels, we were in the middle of nowhere land, or should I say, nowhere ocean. I was on a shift from midnight to 4 a.m. It was dark and boring, but when you're on a naval vessel, there is no stopping until you reach your destination. About two hours into the shift, I started seeing something odd on my radar. I would describe it as a sudden appearance. Now, what I mean by this is when you're out on the open ocean, things just don't appear. They will come in over the horizon. This object, whatever it was, showed up as a medium to large object instantaneously. If I had to describe it to our captain, I would have described it as a medium to large size freighter. What was weird is this object seemed to be paralleling what we were doing as we were now both traveling north. By my radar, I was able to establish this object being about 200 nautical miles to the west of us and seemed to be traveling at an incredible speed of 50 knots. Absolutely 50 knots and absolutely due north. I called over two of my on-watch mates to check out what this object was. They were just as baffled as I was at the time and began to track it on our plotting table. This is how we were able to estimate its course and speed so accurately. We continued to plot and monitor this object on radar for about 20 minutes. Its course and speed never varied once. Unfortunately, we couldn't even go on deck with binoculars to look because it was just so far away. Now, going back almost 40 years at this point, any big vessel traveling at 30 knots would be considered a Lamborghini on water. What I mean by this is back then, there wasn't anything I knew of that large that could travel in open water that fast. The really weird part of this entire aspect was it appeared out of nowhere. Like one moment my radar does a 360 scan and there's nothing there. Then on the next scan, boom, there it is. 
Then after 20 minutes of tracking, it just vanished, disappeared. Where it went, we have no clue. We weren't sure if the vessel had sunk or not. We turned on our air search radar and it showed no air contacts whatsoever. So we knew it was on the surface of the water. After this unknown object disappeared, we knew immediately that if we mentioned it to anyone above us, that it would be disregarded as an anomaly and get our asses chewed out by our captain. After a lengthy discussion, we unanimously decided to destroy the plot evidence and the record of the content. It wasn't worth getting in shit for, especially when we just set sail. It would have made for a long, uncomfortable trip. In conclusion, after decades of thinking about this event, I believe we recorded a very large UFO flying just above the water. There's no way it could have been a helicopter or airplane, military or civilian, at that low of altitude, at the surface of the water. There was no other ships encountered on radar, nor a pod of whales. We could tell a pod of whales easily. They come and go on radar. To this day, I wish I knew what it was, but I'm satisfied I'll never know. What I do know, this incident defied all logical explanation. Hi there, Dave and Marl. I have a great encounter for you guys for Canada's Great Unknown, and I hope you can use it. My name is Sarah. Last summer, my family and I were camping on Quinnell Lake in British Columbia, like we do every summer. This year was more exciting because we bought a brand new 2022 smoker craft boat. We had an old avocado green 1974 boat before, and we are going to be able to finally go up the north and east arm of the lake. Our last boat was unreliable, and you don't want to get stuck on Quinnell Lake in a storm with an unreliable boat. So the second last morning of our trip, we went up the north arm again. It takes a good hour to get up there. I kept looking down the lake behind us, looking to see if our friends were coming. They said they might meet up with us that day. Quinell is a massive lake. It's the deepest freshwater lake in North America. I try not to think about that when I'm on it. So looking down the lake, you don't see the end. It's like the ocean. So we get to where my husband wanted to fish. It's about 10.30 in the morning. We slow down and he puts the rods in the lake. The kids were in the front of the boat playing. It became pretty windy when we slowed down to fish. The water had some big waves. So I was looking down the lake for our friends. Nothing down there. I turned my eyes away for maybe 30 seconds and then looked back again. And there on the horizon was a boat. It was black in color. Again, it was on the horizon. So it was a ways away from us. I said out loud, where did that boat come from? Because 30 seconds ago, there was nothing there. And for it to get to that point, I would have seen it before. My husband said, don't know and carried on with his fishing. I just kept staring at it and asking if it was our friend's boat. My husband said he didn't think so. Then, all of a sudden, the boat shoots across the lake. What should have took a normal boat about five to ten minutes or so, this thing took three seconds. I raised my voice and said, what the hell is that? My husband grabbed the binos and looked at the object, which went back into the middle of the lake, back to the side, and then back into the middle. My husband passed me the binos and said, I don't know what it is. I grabbed the binos and looked through them at the object which stopped moving. I still couldn't understand what the object was. Kind of like a sideways oval. Then, as I was watching, it went under the water. I said, it just went under the water. The object made no sound and was gone. My husband said it must have been a water spout, which I replied, that was no water spout, way too fast. But because it was windy out, that's what made sense to him. The next day, we're tubing the kids by what's called Plato Island, about 1.5 hours away on the water from where we saw the object the day before. We decided to head to shore to have some food. It was about 2.30 in the afternoon. It was hot out, no clouds in the sky, and no wind. My husband was driving the boat slow. 
My youngest son was in the front of the boat playing, and my oldest son was on the tube. I was the watcher, watching him. As I'm watching him, I just kind of looked up in the sky to the left, and there was this object that was just hovering in the air. No sound. It was black, and it was the shape of a sideways oval with a circle in the middle of it that was like, I don't know, kind of looked like a portal is the only way I can describe it. The thing looked like metal, but was something I've never seen before. I would say it was around 30 feet long. I didn't say anything. I just stared at it. I wanted to go closer to it, but my son was a ways away from the boat and was closer to the object than us, and I got a little scared. I knew if I turned away or tried to grab my phone, it would disappear. We were cruising to shore, past the island. The object was mimicking our speed, and it was going behind the island as we were going away from the island. And I watched it till it went completely behind the island and was gone. It's crazy how your brain tries to understand what you don't understand at the time things happen. I totally was trying to comprehend what I saw, and now looking back, it was a UFO. The same thing we saw the day before, up the north arm. It's like it wanted me to see it again, up close. It looked for me and found me again. It is all very bizarre. I have been on Quinell Lake again since this happened, but haven't seen anything. Don't know if that's good or bad. All I know is that I did see something that I have never seen before, and maybe never will again. And now I know we are definitely not alone in the universe, and there are very strange things going on in the world. Hi there, David Merle. My name is Landon, and I thought I would share with you a story that my fiancé and I experienced while camping last year. To this day, I still don't know what to make of it, neither does Stacy. And well, to be honest, it makes me shiver just thinking about what we saw in the sky and the results of seeing whatever that was flying around. Let me explain. Stacy and I are from Red Deer. We've been together four years. We met through mutual friends on a weekend camping gathering. I've always been a nature lover, and when we met, we found out we had a number of qualities in common that eventually led us to dating, falling in love, and now we're planning to get married this August. Since we've been together, Stacy and I have gone on a 10-day camping trip annually to Banff National Park, to the campground we first met. Now, if you've never been in the Rockies and seen the majestic beauty of the Rocky Mountains, you're definitely missing out. Last year, during the pandemic, we took up this cool hobby called geocaching, which is a satellite scavenger hunt game where people hide caches and you use the coordinates on the GPS to find them. So this year, for our annual trip camping, we decided we would incorporate geocaching into it. When we arrived in Banff and set up camp, we planned out our schedule for caching the next day. We decided we were going to start early and get as many caches as we could around Banff in the morning. Then we'd go for lunch at the Banff Springs Hotel. Following that, we would drive into Canmore and collect the caches there. We figured Banff would only be a two-day adventure, while Canmore we could probably get done in a few hours. After a few glasses of wine and planning out our adventure for the next day, we headed off to bed in our trailer, ready to rise and shine early for a busy day of fun in the sun. The next day, we were having so much fun. In Banff, we found 12 caches before lunch. Then we got cleaned up and went for an amazing meal at the hotel. After, we hopped in my truck to make the quick 20-minute drive back to Canmore to see if we could get all of the caches in one day. We challenged ourselves, even though we thought it was doubtful. If we didn't finish, oh well, we could come clean up the rest the next day or so. After finding another 22 caches, we decided to get some grub before heading into the hills to try and do some night hiking and caching. We ate, grabbed a few extra bottles of water, and went off at dusk to take our quest up a logging road past Whiteman's Pond. 
There were three caches up this hill that we wanted to get. We'd never night cached before, so we were prepared for it, with headlamps, bear spray, and bear bangers. By following the map, it was easy to see we wouldn't be spending too much time outside the vehicle except when looking for the caches, which made this trek a little safer as there are some big game that live in the hills, namely grizzly bears. When we finally got up to the third cache, it was about 9.45 at night. This one was the final one we were going to do. The sky was getting darker and the stars were starting to peek out. It was a beautiful cloudless night. We got out of my truck to start looking for the final cache. Of course, if you know caching, you know what a pain in the ass it is when someone hides a damn micro mini cache in the forest. We had our headlamps and flashlights pointed in all directions under the tree as the coordinates took us to a group of thick bushes. Stacy laughingly stated her outrage of the cache owner being so evil to put in a micro in this spot. As we continued our search, we noticed these weird lights that caught our attention coming down the hill on the logging road from above us. There were three of them that looked like flashlights. One was white, another orange, the third one was blue. The lights were all moving and walking at the same speed at about eye level. We first saw them about 50 yards away, and they looked like they were just floating. We heard no noise, no sounds of footsteps or talking, or even laughing. It was just like they were floating towards us. Stacy calmly said to me, I wonder if they even see us. I said back, how could they not? We have our headlamps on and our flashlights going. Get your bear spray out just in case these people aren't friendly, I stated. So we both then slowly reached for our canisters to arm ourselves. These lights got within about 30 yards of us, and they seemed to just stop on the trail. We were dumbfounded by this until Stacy screamed, as all three lights immediately launched straight into the sky. What the hell just happened, Landon? I'm scared, she said. I continued to look up to where these lights kept climbing at what seemed to be at about 10,000 feet, although I'm not even close to being sure if that height number is accurate. The three lights started swirling around in a circle before forming a bright giant ball of light in the sky. Then... It just took off like a bat out of hell and a ball of lightning straight north until we couldn't see it anymore. We quickly hopped back in our truck, forgetting about finding the geocache, and we raced back to our trailer because after this, we were both in dire need of a drink, let me tell you. We drank until we were both intoxicated, still not believing what those lights were or where they came from, but they sure left in a hurry. If anyone else has seen something like this, I will be keeping an eye on the comments below to see what their stories are all about.